Hi, my name is Brandon, and welcome to Starting Nowhere. I got the idea to do this after a friend invited me to have a conversation in the middle of a worldwide pandemic and racial tension in the U.S. I missed the opportunity to learn and be wrong in real time that only comes with having an in-depth, natural conversation. So instead of calling my friends and family more consistently, which I should do, I decided to do this instead. I hope to connect with people I've never spoken to before, people I haven't spoken with in years, and everyone in between. With that in mind, I decided who better than the person who gave me the idea in the first place to be my first guest. My first guest is Jamie Adair. Jamie is a real estate aficionado, and more importantly, someone who pushes his understanding of the world and his place in it. I hope you enjoy our conversation. All right, thank you for uh, joining me today, Jamie. As uh, I was kind of talking about a second ago, you were kind of the catalyst for this as you invited me to have a conversation, which you've been calling the red phone conversations because conversations that are important are had on the red phone, kind of presidential that way. And so I just wanted to kind of get into what got you started there, what your journey's been like, and just uh, what really has stuck out to you during these conversations. Yeah, so it was... um... It was interesting because I stumbled onto the red phone. I am, uh, by my current profession is, uh, I'm a realtor. I function in the real estate world. I've done it for a number of years. Um, for a while, I was also in um, church work, clergy work. Um, and one thing I learned through both of those instances is that generally you keep away from politics, religion, you know, things like this, right? And um, having the DNA about, trying to keep people from killing each other, right? And arguing about stupid things or even important things, but um, pulling away the fabric of uh, connection became so important to me that I lost sight of some of the other things that were valuable, like standing up for something, right? And so I felt like once the George Floyd era started, I couldn't get around and not talking about it anymore. I had already had a lot of um, convictions about not only um, uh, things, things to do with uh, race, race relations, all that, whatever term is this century or this uh, decade, right? Because mm-hmm. they change. Yeah. Um, but like, I, I had lots of feelings about that. When I first started in ministry, I, I had a, a ministry called Revolution Student Ministries, and it was crossing the fence to reconciliation. And uh, I had great big dreams. And it was a predominantly golf course community, white church. And uh, white kids, the whole nine yards, but we were surrounded by an inner city community that we weren't serving. And so I invited them over the fence to my community garden first and then into the youth programs and things like that. And um, it was fairly successful, but I wasn't really supported. And so surviving in that environment was really tough. Uh, What was key though, is that I had tons of seeds sown around certain things that I had deep beliefs in. And you know, when you're going out and you're starting a business or you're trying to run a regular old church, you know, it's good to stay away from the things that divide people. You want to grow in unity, right? So there had been, you figure I'm 43 now, and I have probably not stepped on those toes probably since I was 24, you know? So you got, you got almost 10 years of, or 20 years of silence. And, uh, it, it wasn't that I wouldn't talk it personally about it. I just wouldn't make public statements because once people get heated and they get on social media and we see this right now, they lose their mind. And mm-hmm. I didn't want to be a part of that. I would much rather be effective, make life change through relationships. I'm still a big believer in that. Um, but finally it came to time. And I said, you know what? I picked, I, I, um, <laughs> I picked up the red phone and I started having personal revelation conversations where I explained says, listen, you know what? For so long, I've just kept my mouth shut. And there's a few things I got to get out. And here they are. And the first thing first is people dying like George died just isn't right. And I I can't wait for him to either be proved as a bad guy that was killed accidentally the right by the right people, any of the stuff in the narrative. I don't, I don't have time for that anymore. And then uh, the other was gay marriage. Um, I was in uh, many conservative faith communities where that's just not an accepted practice. And finally, I came to the place after I did marriage counseling and relationship counseling for both straights and gays. And I realized there was a lot more in common uh, in, that, um, in that arena as well. And so it really got me to walk through a lot more of my theology around that. So I came out with a big video. I didn't think it was big, but I, it was big for me because uh, there's a lot of risk. And then uh, I started every, every morning 
Uh, previously, I had done what's called the Jamie Daily, which was just a deep reflective thing about something I'm walking through. Hey, I'm reading this book and this is what it's about. Well, when the topic went to, you know, maybe police violence or, uh, you know, prejudice, whatever, all of a sudden it's a different tone. It's a whole different thing. And I'm doing the red phone and digesting my own issues through it, right? And then people took notice and went silent. <laughs> the people who took notice and commented were people who were very comfortable and familiar with the topic. My, my friends, uh, people who have known me for years, who've never known the side of my uh, world, uh, they just went silent. And I actually thank them for that because I know that for many of them, they, they want to talk or think through this stuff, but they don't feel safe. They don't have the courage to be willing to do it. And so um, a lot of them were silent because it's like, let's go see what he does. Let's see how this works out for him, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then the other half is like, all right, you are on crack and we're just not gonna say it publicly, but we'll, you know, we hope you come back soon, right? Yeah. And uh, so that was my phone, my, my personal phone calls, you know, and self-dialogue. Then somebody made the fine suggestion, well, why don't you have some guests on? And then I started inviting people on who had other things to say that were meaningful um, to the conversation, uh, both that I had a uh, connection with personally, but also um, that had their own perspectives in the scenario that we were talking about. And, and that's just led to a multitude of different um, prongs. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So one of the things you touched on there that I kind of wanted to get your take on, do you think that the vitriol that you see on social media from these people who uh, have trouble discussing touchier topics, do you think that is a cause of the platform or is there something in the way that we've changed over generations to kind of not be able to have those kind of civil discussions anymore, civil disagreements, if you will? That's a really good, that's a good question. If you asked me on Sunday, mm -hmm. I would have said, uh, social media is just a replacement for the community fire, right? You used to have a fire pit in the middle, that's where you did all your food, the cooking, social gathering, that sort of thing. The community discourse used to happen in communal experiences. Now the, the community is spread and we have keyboards only. I'm not an anti-social media person, not just because that's where most of my stuff works, but um, mostly because I think it reflects who we are. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some types of formats that encourage certain behavior more than others. So for example, Twitter is typically a one-sided, right, all the yeah. time. Facebook's a little more conversation, a little bit, not a ton. Yeah. Uh, Instagram is, is uh, picture-based and uh, look good based. So if you wanna talk about vanity, you're gonna go to Instagram. Um, you're going to look at uh, TikTok if you just want to piss off the president. I've been trying to put that in every conversation. <laughs> I have. Um, <clears throat> not because it pisses him off, but because I might be gone soon and people are going to be like, what's this fancy thing he talked about TikTok back in 2020? Okay. Um, so the direct answer to your question is that I think that there are things that we would say on social media and on a keyboard that we would never say in person. Mm -hmm. However, I think it reveals the inner workings of a person's heart because you wouldn't type it if you didn't believe it. And so in some ways it's a truth serum. Now we get all these pissing contests back and forth, mm -hmm. you know, you can't let go. I mean, I had somebody finally unfriend me today. I, I don't know many people that unfriend me, but I pinned her to the ground on a topic. Uh, she was bashing um, uh, one of our um, school board members or our, our school board director and um, it was just one of those because he's greedy. I'm like, well, hmm, I actually know a little bit about this topic. And I said, prove to me. And on and on. Anyway, she just blocked me. It wasn't really much back and forth. She just disengaged and left the whole conversation. And this is a person that's been in my exchanges for three years. Mm -hmm. You know, we've talked about significant numbers of things and she just couldn't do it because it wasn't going to match up with where she thought the world should go. And she was not willing. And that's just part of this is part of our problem is that we aren't willing to learn. We aren't willing to be open. And that is like, yeah, that's deck of social media. It's poison. Ah, in person, we're not willing to learn either, are we? 
I, I think I think you touched on it before. The uh, the three big things he told you not to talk about, right, was race, religion, and politics. So I don't know that we were necessarily better about it before. We just avoided it in person, and then now that we're on social media, we don't necessarily avoid it, and we haven't either developed those muscles or we don't know how to flex those muscles in an online medium. Uh, I, like you said, I don't think there's a lot of people who would type the things that they, uh, excuse me, say the things that they type. We, we can go back to the common one where they say people will talk um, violently about somebody like Mike Tyson, John Jones, or something like that, knowing that good and well that they probably wouldn't say it in person because of fear of phys their physical safety, <laughs> you know? Um, <clears throat> but I, I, think that, I think you touched on a lot of good things there, especially as you were saying, social media kind of exposes who we are, not so much is the uh, creator of who that online persona, but so much it allows you to be that person that you were kind of afraid to be, um, mano y mano, if you will. So have you noticed any of those exchanges that have gotten a little bit different, even maybe on the other side, maybe a little bit more friendlier on social media that uh, once you started these red phone conversations that you think maybe they wouldn't have been able to do in person, that it allowed for it to be a little bit uh, softer and they would reach out to you on phone or something like that to say, hey, I really appreciated what you did. I can't really comment because I'm not comfortable, but I appreciated where you went with that. Yeah, um, what has been really fun about this whole experience is that, I mean, for the most part, anybody who's been on the red phone has been people that I've known personally that there was a trust there. Um, what's been interesting is that I give everybody an out. Say, listen, I get it. This is a very transparent thing. And, and maybe somebody online is going to get upset and say something to you or comment on the thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I give them an out. It took me a while to find somebody to do Venezuela as a conversation, Yeah. right? Um, I suspect that when I have a journalist on to talk about mass media, that's mm -hmm. going to be pretty hot. Uh, I'm working on trying to get somebody for socialism and communism. Mm -hmm. I'm not really a big fan of it on the surface, but if I were honest, what have I learned about it? You know, mm -hmm. um, I have an organizer that's coming on. So like there are people that I would not have normally had more in depth conversations with. Now, biggest question is we're having these things that we wouldn't have normally had. Is it making a difference? Mm -hmm. Like to me, like my whole goal in ministry was to make a difference. My whole goal in real estate is to help people take their next best step, right? And sometimes that's to buy a house and sometimes it's not, right? And, and if the goal doesn't match up with that, I'm not interested. So um, it's, it's really hard to tell early on the differences that you make, both in church work or in this kind of work. Um, the absence of critique scares me a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think there should be more or they're just ignoring. Gotcha. And do you think that's because it's uh, where I'm familiar with your work, obviously, is from Facebook. So do you think that's because you get and you have that little bit warmer audience and you're not if you went to the uh, the cesspool that is YouTube uh, per se, would you would you feel that you'd maybe get a little bit more of that critique that you're uh, you're saying you're missing right now? That's a good thought. Um, maybe once these go out there, you know, at some point. Uh, that you know we'll find the real vitriol or whatever like i'm sure if something like this hit twitter you know those people are just vicious man you know <laughs> yeah. um the, the trolling uh, and and like it or not on facebook you're still somewhat accountable by having a, an account mm -hmm. you know you can you can sort of hide behind some of those other formats um but and possibly and i you know i hate to give myself any credit you know because that's just the personality but like possibly i do it in a way that hopefully is still palatable. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, no, yeah. I got you. I have definitely seen people do it unpalatable. So I know what you mean for sure. Yeah. And, and I feel like sometimes I cheat the opportunity because I don't ask it tougher, but like, mm -hmm. this is my friend. Well, I friend the cop, I had a cop on, right? I yeah. had a red phone, she had a blue phone, yep. hysterical. And I'm like, I had questions that both came off our Facebook page, but also things that I really wanted to have answered. Mm -hmm. Out of that call, realizing that we didn't really answer the really tough ones. Some of the really tough questions there were things like, hey, uh, why do you all stick up for each other and nobody turns another cop in? Mm -hmm. We didn't really get that answer. And I don't think she's gonna give us that answer because I don't know that that's in her awareness. Mm -hmm. Like it's not that. What we did get that I was impressed with is the emotional vulnerability and reality of what it's like to actually be a cop. Now she happened to be a woman, right? Mm -hmm. And so 
uh, there's probably social stereotypes that go in with, oh, she's probably more scared because she's little. But mm -hmm. the reality is, is that most cops likely have fear and that's probably why they're shooting anyway, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so hearing it from her voice adds context. And I, I don't necessarily know that I have to agree with everything um, that she goes through or talks about as the way to do law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, it makes the analogy to fishing. Yep. I have to fish a bunch to get one. Mm -hmm. You know, to me, I'm going, granted, I don't, it's not my job. My job is something different. But I think, gosh, you've got to find a way to stop nine people to get one, potentially violate people's rights for one. Like, mm -hmm. to me, that's not a great thing. But in our pleasant conversation, I'm not going to go back and say, now give me an answer on this. <laughs> but it's thoughts that hopefully myself or other people still process and hopefully do it in a more dignified way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, again, this is the first time I'm doing this, so I can't say that I, I'm going to be able to do that either. But I think one of the things you look at there, um, from my perspective, is potentially reaching out to them on those topics. So you said something there that I, I kind of want to dig back into. And on that note, I actually, you did say something there that I want to dig back into. I, I did not get a chance to watch that one. I know that you had uh, her on recently. Um, but are you saying that for the n stop nine to get one, is that more of a quota thing that it sounds like or or is it just more so she's saying that hey for every nine people or so that and i know i'm not going to hold you to those numbers i know we're just kind of uh just throwing them out there but for every nine people you stop maybe one of them is actually violating some statute or something like that or was she saying i need to do that so i can get that number that i need to get to yeah no she didn't really talk about any quotas for her it was more this is really what i learned well uh, uh police are trained to believe that everybody somewhere probably is going to be a criminal or that your job is to see people as criminal and there is not a innocent until guilty for them it's a i've got to prove that you're guilty right mm -hmm. it's a different premise than your attorney in a court of law and mm -hmm. this is you know for them my job is to find bad guys and for her for her specifically it was i've got to find bad guys got to find bad guys got to find bad guys Oh, not a bad guy here. Oh, not a bad guy there. Oh, not a bad guy there. Ah, found a guy with a, you know, AK-47 and some meth. Bad guy. Check. Got it. Right. Mm -hmm. So for, for her, it was, this is how policing works during traffic stops. Uh, you know, that's when they catch the lion's share of people that have war warrants out, uh, mm -hmm. drugs, things like this. Right. And the law allows for people who have uh, taillights that are out or, weaving or whatever the, the uh, legislature allows as probable cause for stops, those things then allow her to do what she needs to do to determine if you're a bad guy or not a bad guy and then mm -hmm. moves on, right? Um, to me, it was hard to hear that you have to view everybody that way because my mindset is not that everybody's intrinsically bad. Mm -hmm. My mindset is you're bad until you prove me that you're not good, right? But if I went out with that mindset, I'd probably be killed. Like, like, do do do, you know, going, I'm, I'm going through the wilderness. So like their world sees everything as uh, a nail because they're the hammer. Mm -hmm. and, he and just makes the analogy about a fish. Exactly. And I, I think that's interesting. And again, I don't want to go too far into that topic because I, I'm not going to ask you to answer for the things uh, that she said. But I do think that that's interesting. Obviously, you know that I have a military background and um, I've known quite a few MPs, military police and uh, other infantry members and those type of things. And that's not the way they do it. And they're in hostile countries where the people actively, I shouldn't say that, not the people, but there is a certain segment of the populations that do wish to do them harm and anyone in that uniform harm. And they still can't see everybody that way. You know, they have to see them as people until otherwise uh, the situation calls for it. And so it's just very interesting in the way that the military tactics are in a, a very heightened and dangerous situation uh, to the way the police see it in what should be their own streets, you know. And I, again, I'm not going to ask you to answer for that or anything. Well, I think we can go into that. Later. She actually okay. spoke to that uh, the best officers so far in her experience are ones that have been in military service mm -hmm. because they have the heightened awareness of danger around mm -hmm. and they know how to modulate their responses to it um she said that's where they get some of their best recruits is from the military um 
and of course, you know, if you're not really trained often, if you, yeah. you know, go through a few weeks, I, I'm, I'm trivializing this, but yeah, if yeah. you go through a few weeks of training, all of a sudden you've got a gun and you got to go stare down some people, it's a different scenario than you've been in Baghdad in the dirt and been shot at a whole bunch, bullets whizzing by your ears, freak you out a little less. <laughs> they say that. <laughs> They say that I definitely, uh, and I think I've told you this story before about um, a friend of mine who was in Afghanistan and in Afghanistan, they don't really shoot at you as much. They send mortars, they send rockets and things like that over the wall, but they're not aiming. They're just blindly sending them and everything. And so, you know, the first time he was there, uh, the siren goes off, he takes off, he gets to the bunker, he dives, cuts his elbow, like the whole thing. And then by like the third or fourth month he's there, he's come, coming back from the chow hall with a I think he had eggs or something. I don't remember. And then he, if he hears the siren, he's like, no, I'm not dropping these eggs. Like, I'm getting back to where I'm going. I'm not dropping these eggs. If I get blown up, I get blown up. I'm not dropping these eggs. So yeah, I think, I think there is something to say about that, but obviously that leads to a lot of other uh, hypervigilance problems and things like that. But um, all right. So, so to moving on, because like I said, we can spend all day on any one of the conversations you've had Venezuela or the yeah. LEO or any of those other people and stuff. So I, I want to kind of dive into what inside you really said that I have to start doing these type of things and really start educating myself because it's not just the red phone conversations and correct me where I may be uh, misremembering something, but you're reading books. You're also doing research on certain topics and those type of things. Talk to me a little bit about what it was inside you that said, it's not that the world itself doesn't make sense. It's that I don't know enough. That's a good, if I said that quote, that's awesome. <laughs> You said I it with your that. eyes. You said it with your eyes. There you go. Yes. <laughs> my heart, my heart was saying it. Um, it's, it's funny because it, it, that is, that is really the exact phrase I feel like I'm living out because there's a lot of times where I don't know it. Now, my Jamie dailies are generally things that I've either processed or I'm coming out on the other side. So I'm used to sort of preaching in a lighthearted way to my people, mm -hmm. you know, but um, here's the, here's the things that I really feel like um have been eye-opening for me. Uh, we as a people do not have a capacity to see things in uh, multi-layers. Uh, it is either right or left, right wing, left wing. wing. It's either uh, all wrong or all right. And we, we, have a, we as a people, and I probably believe this before, but coming through 2020, I've seen it even more now, that we have come to a place where um, we are willing to look past glaring, horrible, terrible things because it already aligns with the lion's share of our beliefs. Mm -hmm. And that's frightening. And, and no matter what side of the politics you're on, if you pick a right or a left side, there are things in both camps that we should be like, going, huh, wait a second. I never mm -hmm. really thought about this. Um, personally, uh, I've always felt like black people matter period. And I had That's to a change. very controversial stance to take. That's a strong stance. Well, I, I said something different. <laughs> Notice that? Yeah. I didn't say black lives matter. Mm -hmm. Did you? I've, when I started, I would post whatever I had to say and then do, you know, BLM or whatever. And it was really to tag that that's the topic, right? right, right. Then it became that I was endorsing what the thing was. I didn't ever not necessarily endorse it. I was ambivalent to what the underpinnings of that particular cause was or wasn't. But mm. the people who were, you know, anti-black anything were saying, don't you know, they're socialist and they're the devil and oh my God, you know, look at all these unpeaceful protests. Uh, I'll have to assume that that accent was on accident. It wasn't a uh, actual representation of anybody specific. <laughs> that was more a TV preacher. <laughs> yeah. See that? Like waning of the hand. Yeah, I um, but the thing is that I, that I realized is that there is so much co-opting. Listen to this. This is important. There's so much co-opting of other people's stuff that it becomes really hard to separate mm. uh, being for something and not being for another. I kind of mm. had to make this decision in my head and I've not really made any massive claims or articulated it out to the public necessarily. But I said that I could be for black lives, but I don't have to necessarily say that, oh, I'm in a line with Black Lives Matter, because mm -hmm. apparently there's like a whole school of thought about that. So then I had to dive in. I'm like, what the hell does all this mean? Okay, let's dive in. Do you know how much reading you've got to do to catch up with them? 
Depends on like who the, the them is. That's the part of them, the this topic. This them, this topic, this whole topic yeah, is of yeah. them, right? Th them, them is everybody who says, because they send me all this crap on Facebook through mm -hmm. videos. Oh, did you hear this conspiracy, right? Mm -hmm, and yeah. then the other side is, by the way, have you read uh, Mark's book on this? Mm -hmm. Or have you read that race and equality can only happen in the social system, the system that individualism doesn't work? Mm -hmm. like, how many more college? I, I got a job, people. Like, <laughs> Like, how do you function doing these tools? Anyway, so I um, uh, started a, uh, visited two, three times to a book club. Uh, mm -hmm. It was uh, Defunding the Police was the book. Like, I don't remember what the name of it was necessarily, but right. that's the topic, of it, right? Um, uh, currently reading Bonhoeffer, um, basically his whole life story, like tremendous, unbelievable uh, depth of, clarity that we should have right now in our moment mm -hmm. uh i studied uh one thing got me triggered about this was that i had a very close uh person to me uh challenge me on the idea that more black people no sorry more white people are killed by cops than black people mm -hmm. and i went that's interesting i don't think that database even existed because mm -hmm. a friend of mine tried to do some research about six years ago and there was no database at that point so he recreated the database mm -hmm. so i don't know where you're getting your data from so i had to go and figure out what the heck this guy clearly doesn't know what he's talking about he's just getting it off of a news outlet right mm -hmm. so i did probably i don't know 10 15 hours of research on figuring out where and who collects what data on deaths and it's not oh just go to the fbi that's not the great data that's not the best source we think it is. Only 40% of the police uh, departments yeah. report to that, yeah. okay? And then the second best source is uh, crowdsourcing. Like, if you get shot and I know you, oh man, my boy Brandon, I gotta report this, right? And then they go through all the um, medical and uh, um, news reports, and that's how that gets done. Yeah. And then there's another database that's probably the most thorough, which is on um, uh, the, acronyms going out national violent death something or the other and that's mm -hmm. the one that has all of the uh, uh coroner's reports medical and police reports um algorithm um, they make codes for each different thing so if it was with a gun if there was a threat of violence if it was in a vehicle in a home each one of these has a different code right, right. and then they have people that just sit there and code all this stuff so the fbi one might actually be out of business soon because they're trying to get funding for it and this national database of violent crime, I think that's what it's called. Um, so to answer your question very succinctly now, I'm gonna copy and paste right to this part, <laughs> is that I've, I've ended up having to go on a super long journey of diving in deeply to the topics that I feel like I can wrap my brain around and um, come up with a solution. And that's usually where I've gotten my guests from too, because I know that I need more info about this. And uh, having the community organizer, that was super helpful. I didn't understand. I went to two protests during this whole deal never yeah. done that before I, I saw that that was uh the comments on that one were good too <laughs> oh yeah i, I almost <laughs> wanted to do it again just for more comments but yeah. um it was neat to me because i hadn't had the exposure and so many people that look like me sit at home they see the tv they see the university mall burning they go oh my god this is what it's all about i'm like can it really be all about that really mm -hmm. when you go out there and you go oh, oh, oh feeding the homeless guys over there and they got water over here and they're doing some chanting over here. I didn't know who was doing what. I didn't really understand the different roles. Like yeah. there's job keys. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's why I needed the organizer to tell me. Um, so went to the protest, um, checked that out. That was kind of interesting. Um, I, I shocked. I worked through the thought, why are there so many white people here and no people of color? Like mm -hmm. that was a big hang up for me. That was, whew, and now that I've got that sorted out, it's not a great answer, but it's still an answer. There's some resolution there. So these questions in my book, my uh, perspective, mm -hmm. should not always end in more questions. You should right. get an answer. And I think some people just love asking more questions to ask more questions only and not really have any sort of resolution. So I've enjoyed coming up with a few resolutions along the way. Gotcha. Um, one of them is I'm not really a big fan of socialism. <laughs> So, so we'll touch on that in a second, but there was two things in there that I wanted to kind of pick up on before I, uh, I moved on. You mentioned that he brought up the point that more white people are killed by cops. When you did your research, what did you end up finding out to, to answer to that? 
So best, best is my knowledge. Uh, numerically, there are more whites mm. killed by police officers yep. than black people. Yep. However, if you take it per capita, the numbers are way different, yep. right? The hardest part about when you explain that to people, then they go, and this is, oh, this is one of the other things I learned. You ready? Mm. I've got your question. I have your answer. You ready? Here's your answer. And then, oh, here's another question. Yeah. I didn't yeah. really want it. They didn't really want the answer of the first one. No, no. Moving the no. goalposts is a very common tactic in those situations. Yeah, for sure. So you're so used to this. I didn't even know that analogy. Moving the goalposts. There you go. So then, then the problem goes to, well, more blacks commit more crime than yeah. other people. And unfortunately, as far as I can tell, I didn't do a ton of research on it, yeah. but capita there is an inner city that mm -hmm. has a strong dna around uh some criminal behavior right mm -hmm. and then what ends up happening is that there's no and i didn't know this this was like news to me right right i would like to know what the source is uh there's a source on this um what ended up happening was during the civil rights movement the taboo around being arrested was alleviated i mm -hmm. didn't know this. did you know about this you ever heard of this yeah i mean john lewis was arrested how many times you say 20 30 times or something like that I had no idea. Like, that was like a thing. Like, okay, fine. We're going to protest. You arrest us. And then we'll get out and do this over again. Mm -hmm. I had no awareness about that. And so it, it would seem to make sense that if a culture ha lost some of that taboo, mm -hmm. that you might have more arrests and it wouldn't be such a, a, a weird thing. However, now we're talking about crime, not protesting, you know, like these are very different things. And I think people like to lump all that together yeah. and then, um, it, it gets lost in the middle because we miss um, we miss that some cultural things lose their influence over time and they can take on a different morphing, right? Mm -hmm. With a new new mindset. Does that make sense? Yeah, I got you. Yeah. So the two things I'll touch on really quick there too, because there was something that I, I don't know if you just missed it or if you maybe you were not aware, but one of the things when it comes to uh, the black people commit more crime uh, argument it's not like crime is a thing you can find. Crime is a thing that has to be discovered by stopping someone, as you said. And the research out overwhelmingly shows that black people are more likely to be stopped. So if black people commit, and the, the analogy I've been using is that if black people smoke weed at the same number of times that white people do, uh, let's say it's four out of 10. I don't know what the actual number is, but it's just for argument's sake, it's four out of 10. Well, if you stop 100 black people and you only stop 50 white people, it's gonna say that they get arrested at half the rate. So crime isn't something that is just out there and it immediately turns somebody in. It has to be looked for, it has to be stopped. And if you're stopping a group more, which over-policing in the black community is a well-known fact as well. And again, the research bears this out. It's not just anecdotal, uh, then you're gonna have that. And secondary to that, like you said, the taboo around arrest has been removed because that is the reality of the black experience for a lot of people going way, way back is you're gonna get arrested. Not even specifically when you're protesting, when you're doing something, uh, yeah. quoting John Lewis again. Right, yeah. right. You're quoting, quoting John Lewis again, getting into good trouble. You're just doing nothing and you're arrested for it. And so you can't make it taboo to get arrested if I'm going to be arrested for no cause. You know what I mean? So mm. it's not just protesting. It's not just doing good trouble. It's not those things. It's also just the uh, prevalence of being arrested for little to no cause. And so if that is my experience, how can it be taboo to be arrested anymore? I'm going to be arrested. I have to accept that as fact because I know so many people who it's true for. And again, the numbers bear this type, this type of thinking out. So uh, just those two things really quick uh, to go. Uh, and what's imp I, love, I love that because um, uh, the, piece, the piece specifically about how enforcement and uh, patrolling works right. is usually set policy-wise by the district, right? The policing mm -hmm. says, yep. oh man, we have crime over here. Now, it's not like the black community says, we don't want any cops here to investigate these homicides. Nobody mm -hmm. says they don't want justice for their kids who die by gang violence or whatever, right? They, they do want to have uh, not a lawless land. However, um, what I find is interesting, I'll go back to my cop friend. Right. Um, there's not, I don't have people coming in front of my house very often to do drive-by patrols, mm -hmm. right? Like, if you trolled my neighborhood often enough, you'd find out that the guy who lives right over here sells plenty of drugs. <laughs> plenty. I have even called to try to turn him in. I didn't realize all I had to do was say he's black. That would have done it. Yeah. Kidding. Dark no, humor. 
Yeah, yeah. First of all, dark humor is another pun, and that's great. But uh, oh no, oh no, <laughs> oh, I didn't mean that one. <laughs> yeah, but I uh, know <laughs> it's it, sad to say I'm not sure that that is even a joke. That's a joke because it's a true thing, not a joke because it's funny. Yes. <laughs> but um, yes. no, but no, but I, I think again, you're pointing out exactly what we're talking about over policing, and the more times you stick your hand into a skittle bowl, the more likely you're going to come up with a red one. You know, right? <laughs> I think there's red Skittles anyways, I, now yeah. that I'm questioning that. Yeah. <laughs> you just think about it, in the white community, how many times could you pull over a car and find an expired bottle of hydrocodone? It might have been a prescription at one point, but after 30 days, now all of a sudden that bottle is no longer licensed prescription and you could be arrested for that. How many times do you have to pull people over in South Tampa before you're going to find some soccer mom that's got some old scripts laying around? Hmm? No, if it's that easy to get drugs, I might just start pulling cars over there. I don't know. Let's find out. <laughs> Let's do some research. <laughs> no. Oh, wait. Uh, hey, are you, are you still Miami Dade? I have a question for you. Oh, I am. And I don't know where this question is going. I can't speak for uh, or represent Miami in no uh, fashion. You said you didn't know anybody. Have you met anybody there who's been pulled over yet? Negative. No. Dang it. I need you to post on your, do you have any friends in Facebook land or anything there? Uh, I do not, but Gazelle might be able to, uh, Introduce me to some, obviously, with her going to school here, she has a much wider base, you know, uh, here. Okay, so here's maybe. a question. Yep. My cop, my cop friend says, last she knew, Miami-Dade, Broward County, 100% pull gun pullover state or uh, department. So meaning, if they pull a car over, they automatically have their gun, either hand on gun or drawn. I so said, are you kidding me? Policy. Are you saying Miami-Dade uh, officers or sheriff? Because we, I, I think you, do you know Ruben? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Ruben, uh, he's a sheriff uh, deputy down here. All right, well, let's call him up. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So he, I, again, I don't know if he'll know what the Miami-Dade officers do. I assume there's some uh, crosstalk there or something like that. But again, assumptions are often wrong. So, Right. Um, all right, let me check the time really quick. I don't want to overstay. No, we're good. No, we're good. Yeah. Okay, so let's go. I want to I get your most controversial thing, I think, that's been said on any of the, the red phone conversations you have. What it, to you really just shook you and, and later you maybe found out it was true. Maybe you found out it was false. Maybe you knew it was false or true immediately, but just something that was said in any of those conversations, did anything kind of floor you uh, and make you really question if you wanted to keep doing that or make you go, wow, this is why I'm doing this. Ooh, you know, it's interesting. I would like to have something that was controversial that I go, aha, mm -hmm. right? And I think in every conversation, like there's a little something in my head that, that goes through and I go, hmm they may not be aware of how that might sound to others. Right. Yeah. And, and all my, every single one of my calls, I had a judge on or a future potential judge, right. you know, and you know, I can't think of them right now, but I'm just saying like all yeah. types of calls that I've had. Um, there's been some where I'm like, you know, I'm just going to let that fly and maybe somebody else will address it at some point. And I just, you know, it's not my job to say, you know, you said, yeah, it's just, it's not, that's not what this is. This is, this is to help gain awareness. So, um, I, I think that for me, one of the best takeaways was from Scarlett. I'm, there's so many, right, right? Right. I mean, like you're talking about people I already love. I'm already endeared by and with, mm -hmm. um, high school, longtime friends, you know, but Scarlett, the Venezuelan, uh, shared a very poignant thought, uh, her story is essentially that she, you know, was an illegal immigrant here for a while, not by her own choice. It happened through a marriage situation. Mm -hmm. And she, uh, her father lost everything back home, lost his farm, was given a, he came one day and the deeds were being given to other people, right? Mm -hmm. For his land. Like a real legitimate uh, mid-level business owner lost everything. He's mm -hmm. working today in uh, Inner Bay as a horse tender, mm -hmm. like, but he's here. And um, one of the most poignant thoughts she said was that our country, if we're not careful, will grow to hate each other so much that we could fall apart just like my country did. Mm -hmm. And I was like, whoa. She had a few more zingers in there, but like the vitriol that we have, especially during political season, during um, how we feel about each other, during whether it's a sort of a riot, a sort of a protest, sort of a, um, uh, you know, we get into these skirmishes and we just rip each other apart. And it's like, 
we're, we could be that close. We could be, you know, we could give just enough fuel um, fighting so much for something that we could ruin the very thing we think we're trying to save. And I think she had such a beautiful uh, expression of it because she saw the other side. And I think so often the Republican side might fight, oh, let's do this, let's do this, and we're gonna keep it this way. And they have no idea by doing this, they're gonna lose all of that, right? Or the, the Democrat side is you know, fighting so much to do this other thing. And if you've got that, you may not have the very thing that you say you thought you wanted. You know, Take it all from the rich, fine. Guess what? Where's all the rich? They move out, they take all the money with them. You know, like There's basic things that we can see in other countries and cultures that are just normal to them that we think will never happen here. I mean, who thought we'd be out of work, out of building for six months? Mm. No, and like I said, it can happen here. I think that is something that Americans uh, seem to be learning a lot. Uh, I think when anybody in the military who's deployed, uh, I think you can kind of see the differences in sacrifice that some people are able and willing to make compared to the average uh, American. And I'm not saying that every American should be necessarily uh, ready and willing to take that. That's exactly why people sign up for the military. But what I am saying is that when it comes down to it, what are we actually willing to sacrifice for the things that we want to get? And I think what she's talking about there is hopefully that we get there before we tear down everything we're trying to uh, achieve. You know, you don't want to tear out the foundation of the building while you're building the roof. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and again, I'm not a builder, but I assume that, that to be, <laughs> I assume that to be true. <laughs> But uh, I, I think, again, I think that what she was saying there and the fear from that having seen it going down, um, hopefully will help her make that uh, that same realization to other people like she has done with you. And now I know you can share that message and everything else. So I, I hope that that's where we all end up and we keep having those conversations. But I also at the same time, I will caution to using that kind of sentiment uh, to avoid having those conversations, to avoid doing any of the work, to 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 avoid letting things get into an argument because sometimes you need to. Sometimes an argument is necessary. Uh, you're a married man. I'm in a long-term relationship and I know a lot of people who've been in them. If you never argue, then it's going to fall apart in the biggest argument. You have to have those things where you actually get that out as well. And, and I would like to hope that that's what the country is going through right now is some of those arguments that we've been putting off for so many years and now we're, we're forcing ourselves to have them. So but like you said, Facebook is such a uh, uh, vitriolic place sometimes that I don't know when we haven't been having arguments, but <laughs> so. Yeah, she, she made one point that uh, was, was kind of interesting. She goes, if you, don't, um, if you don't allow somebody else to disagree with you, then maybe you don't really have the freedom that you think you have. Mm -hmm. I was like, ooh, I'm pretty good too. I'm like, did you practice these lines? <laughs> <laughs> You know, and it's just interesting. Think, uh, we're going to go socialism for a bit? <laughs> I think that's a weird way to phrase it. Uh, I don't think, I think once you go socialism, you're kind of stuck with it. But yeah, we can, we can definitely touch on socialism now. Well, it's fascinating. I'm, I'm coming into a lot and, and I might get some more uh, awareness later and I might change some of this stuff. But Absolutely. Um, I, uh, it was interesting to me, and I posted this a lot. I made a video today actually about this, uh, mostly about the school board, but at the end of it, the, the gist is that I've been posting the same thing over and over again about uh, when you come into power, what kind of leader are you gonna be? Mm -hmm. I saw that. Right, post that a number of times. I got ready to send it last night, and Carly goes, you know, you posted that before. I said, yeah, but it's even more true now. <laughs> right? <laughs> so I, I watch as we tear apart our school board, we tear apart the superintendent. And right now ours is super upheaval. Uh, you guys have the luxury of having enough COVID that you don't have to worry about going back. We have to fight to either stay or not stay. I don't really have an opinion. My kids are going back for however long it's gonna happen before we have a breakout, whatever. Yeah. Um, tomorrow morning at eight o'clock, they're gonna start a new meeting to maybe redo all of these decisions they made, right? Yeah. But we have all these people who have such vitriol and they have no awareness of what the system really is and how it works. It's almost like telling you in the military how to do recon or how to do move, moving troops and stuff. I wouldn't have the clue how to load a thing on a ship. I wouldn't have a clue how to move a satellite or a drone to do a thing, but yet I could sit on my couch and have an opinion about it, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, socialism, we're gonna go there. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I think there's a lot that people fight for inside of that idea mm -hmm. that if they got it, 
I don't think they want it, but let's say they got it, whatever the they is, I, you know, I'm just broad brush. When they get it, then they go, guess what? If you disagree with my socialism, you know, in a country, a socialist country, let's say, you don't really have a very easy way to go and protest. Mm -hmm. Like that doesn't happen very often unless you're literally trying to overthrow your government. You know, in some countries it happens over and over again, I guess I've been told, right. you know? So like for me, I'm really diving into this whole idea of who will you be when you become the person in charge? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you can throw all this mud you want. This person sucks. This president sucks. This future president might suck. You know, all these things. And okay, Mr. Big Pants, you'll become in charge. What are you going to do? Because literally we have people running for the school board that now are going to be school board members. Guess what? You're going to have to deal with what are you going to do during COVID? You had all these opinions before. Now what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And for me, it rolled right into a lot of the socialism conversation because you look at some socialism countries and they're not very open and welcoming. In fact, they're uh, very closed, fear-based and mm -hmm. poverty mentality, you know? And that's over glossing it. I get it. I know right. there's probably some shining star somewhere, but for the most part, the freedoms that you get to protest here, the mm -hmm. things that you get to say or whatever you want to say, you get permission to do that, you know? I mean, uh, I think something you touched on there that uh, I have heard some stuff about is, uh, I believe her name was Melissa Chen. Uh, she was a Singaporean journalist and she did an episode of Joe Rogan's podcast and she talked a little bit about that, how Singapore basically makes the United States look like a third world country. Her words, exactly how she said it. And she's, you know, from Singapore and she's lived here in the United States, citizen of the United States now for I don't know how long, but, and part of that is because of the socialism they have there. And, but she says at the same time, you, you like you just said you don't have the freedom to say things you don't have the freedom to protest the government you don't have the freedom to do certain things but you have a nice house you have uh, good support systems and everything and i think ultimately what you're talking about there is what freedoms are you willing to trade for security i believe it was benjamin franklin who said uh I, i'm gonna mess this up but i think the quote overall is uh, a man who trades security for freedom deserves neither or something to that effect yeah uh, well, and supposedly again i've not researched it this yeah. was a, a banter that somebody had on Facebook. Um, supposedly Franklin early days wasn't pro versions of democracy. It was like some hybrid thing. Mm -hmm. And then like, that phrase was acquitted to somebody else. And then it's always been said that it's Franklin. But yeah. basically to your point, what are you giving up in order to have security? Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, that safety blanket. Because social security is a socialist uh, yeah. infrastructure that we have. FDR, oh, FDR. That was a good read. <laughs> yeah. I have not read much about FDR personally. Oh man, I'm telling you, Trump and FDR, shockingly similar. <laughs> That's a hot take. I haven't heard that before. That's all. I'll have to look that up. I, I believe you. I believe you've done the research, but that's just interesting. I never have heard that before. I would have never thought it. I, I, uh, when, um, his personal biographers talked about how he, uh, he was very short very uh crass he would get his people to fight amongst themselves mm. to come up with a solution and then um when they would come up with something he didn't like he'd just fire them both Solid like, what? Solid and he did everything <laughs> he did everything by um uh presidential um a, a, a executive order and yeah. then i had no idea tons of what he said and did like went to the supreme court and got knocked down and he would just figure out a new way to write it again. But the country was like literally falling apart and he was doing whatever he could. And this man was wealthy. I had no idea his family had a lot of money. And mm -hmm. so when he wanted to raise the taxes, you ready for this one? The man raised the taxes. He asked for 90%, like above, I think it was like 300,000 or something. I don't remember what that number, but above a certain rate, it needs to be 90%. And then uh, Congress wouldn't allow it. They said, no, that's crazy. He goes, okay, presidential um, edict, we're doing 100%. What? And then, of course, Congress, or not Congress, but the Supreme Court knocked it down. But at the end of the day, like you have our memory uh, today forgets those things that we just remember all the good about somebody, mm -hmm. you know? Social Security, Department of the Interior, uh, the bridges, and all the stuff that they built because you needed some work for these people to do, you know? We're paying people to stay home right now. Yeah, well, uh, that that's an interesting point that you bring up there. And we'll, when it comes to socialism, 
I think that um, what American people should think about is we're never going to go fully to socialism. We're never going to fully go to communism. We're never fully going to go to any system. We don't even have a, the true democracy right now. You know, we're always going to have a hybrid system. That's what the reality of America is and will always be. And so I think when we're looking to include some socialistic endeavors, I think we have to first recognize we already have. And second, we have to recognize that we can't just say socialism bad, even though the construct completely is not great. Uh, I think more so you have to say this specific piece that they're trying to put in right now is bad. Because what we're letting people do is use buzzwords to keep us from actually having a conversation again. That's just right. talk about it. That's right. Well, and here's the hard part. I think that what happens is that you see people protesting, and I'm going to use protesting the term of rioting, because right, right now this whole, this whole Portland thing and freaking mm -hmm. Seattle thing, all that, that's no Black Lives anything. That's, these are a very different experience going on. And then people can look to them and go, see, that's what socialism is going to get you. And you mm -hmm. paint this big picture is being painted about how evil these people are. And then... Uh, I once was a part of a page that got shut down. Um, Wait, that was, sorry. What is that? I'm not familiar I was with a that. Part of a page that got shut down. Oh, part of a page. I thought you said particle page. Okay, gotcha. Sorry, I apologize. Yeah, no, no. Like, like uh, I wanted to figure out where to go to do a protest, see what that's even like, and there was like a page for it, so I, I joined or whatever. Um, there was police in it that were undercover. There mm. were other, uh, you know, super conservatives in there that were mm. causing some sort of ruckus. I don't know. Sure. Um, but I asked some questions about what does it mean to be, can, can we have real race relations conversations um, in light of independent, um, sorry, individualism, capitalism, and democracy, or does it have to be in communism, socialism? Mm -hmm. What I got out of that, it wasn't a fight or anything like that, but it was such a strong, full version, deep mouth uh, sandwich of, that com where that conversation was going to go that I realized very quickly if anybody who wasn't open heard or felt the um, passion around that mm -hmm. would automatically just shut it down directly and say see that is what's happening in Portland and some people in that same group had been out there came back and was talking about how wonderful it was I was like oh, I don't know if I'd be bragging about that you know I think what you touched on there as well is my personal perspective is what causes a lot of the problems we have is in that people don't know how to talk respectfully, particularly when they disagree. Um, I think we already have a problem speaking respectfully to one another on a lot of topics just because of the way we've communicated over the years. But I, especially when it comes to somebody disagreeing, because I find that if I, I usually try to do this and it's not always effective and I'm not always great at it, but I use overly uh, formal language. And it usually disarms people. Not always. People just, if they want to be vitriolic, they're going to be. But sometimes if you use overly formal language, especially in social media, they, it's weird for them to call you an idiot if you're just, you're like stating uh, whatever fact is or whatever stuff is you use. No name calling. You don't do anything. You just kind of point those things out. But again, I think that's why those conversations, like you said, if you're not open uh, to the passion, as you called it, uh, when really, I think it's disrespectful language. If you just said what you had to say without doing that, you could have a lot more conversations and maybe even get somebody to see your point of view a little bit better. Yeah, uh, maybe I should change that word uh, because I think your point mm -hmm. is so well said, uh, especially when we communicate with each other. Um, what I was experiencing with, with them, I think was such a um, dogmatic, uh, taken for grantedness and the yeah. depth of the overthrow that they wanted to see. Yeah, yeah. Right? This isn't just a deep on the police conversation. This was much deeper than that. And I was like, gosh, I'm just not for that level of whatever you're talking about. I mean, if we all need to be equal financially, and you basically, some of this went to the point of, you know, we came here and stole the land from the Indians. So we should go ahead and do a resteal and, you know, disperse among everybody. And this wasn't necessarily you know, African Americans are here and they're broke and they need to be given something. This was much more um, redistribution of all wealth. And, mm -hmm. you know, as a realtor property owner, uh, I, I, that's a thing for me. Like, uh, like that's part of what makes how our system works is because you have ownership of a thing and you're going to mm -hmm. have appreciation. And under what they were pitching, the idea was that if you have appreciation, they just take it away and give it to other people. Yep. And I'm like, well, oh. 
uh, and I, I think I started getting all scratched. I shudder to use those people as too big of an example because I don't think it matters what topic we're going into. You're going to have somebody who is uh, an extremist, right? So yes, there are people who want to abolish the police. And I think we touched on this when we talked uh, on yeah. the phone conversation. The people who want to abolish the police, not most people do. There are people who want the police to uh, be able to do whatever they want. Not most people do. And it's the same thing when you're talking about socialism. It's the same thing when you're talking about redistribution of wealth. Uh, there's not a lot of people who really want to do it. But again, a lot of times, depending on your politics, you'll see it as everybody wants uh, to steal from the poor or everybody wants to give out all the rich money to everybody else. And you have to take, I think, a more centrist position on that and say, well, not centrist position, but more so see that that's the extreme and you're just posting the extreme side of what you disagree with to make your point. And it's not very effective for anybody. Yeah, you're, you're spot on. It gets that way. And that and it fits inside of your uh, political mindset, mm. you know, so easy. And I'm like, don't you realize there's more white women on welfare than there are black anything? Like, yep. like don't we, reg you know, most people don't realize that that earned income child tax credit, right? That thing, that's yep. a welfare credit. I mean, yep. like, how is that different? And then, boy, it got me hot. Guess what? If you took that COVID <laughs> money, you're on welfare too. Uh, right? Like, unemployment itself is welfare. It's one of the biggest yeah. uh, pieces of Socialism. Yeah. Yeah. So and anyway, it was just, it was one of those things. I think that's the one thing that gets me a little bit hot is when I see people not being academically honest and it's just, you know, just come, really, really, really. Yeah. I, I Again, I, like you said, you, I forget what topic you were exactly talking about before, but when you mentioned basically people having disingenuous conversations, where you don't actually mean what you say, and when confronted with fact or when confronted with just asking how you got to that conclusion, they back off, they change, they move the goalposts, they change the topic and, you know, and they just keep doing that because they're not having a genuine conversation. They don't really want to. They're interested yep. in just hearing what they saying, what they said and either letting it sit out in the ether or having it uh, repeated back to them or, or giving a hell yeah or whatever that situation is. Right. <laughs> so, all right. Um, I wanted to get into one more thing. You started this with a complete concept of evaluating race relations in America, uh, maybe your blind spots, not just the race. Obviously, you've gone into socialism now. You've gone into what's happening in Venezuela. You've talked to LEOs. You've talked to a bunch of different things. Uh, where do you think you are now as far as that process goes? What are the things that you've really learned over the, the past couple of months uh, that you've been doing this? I believe it's been three, four months now. Uh, what are the things that you really, that you just are shocked that it took this long for you to find out? you know, that maybe was common knowledge to somebody else or just that you didn't have access to other than FDR, obviously. <laughs> we'll go on FDR yeah. later. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my big learning is just that I don't know that, uh, I just became gr dramatically surprised at how unwilling people are to, to be open, mm. you know? Like, I just, we really are at a very closed, shut down time. And I've really enjoyed being able to, uh, uh, you figure, the smallest of the videos got 500 views, but you're talking an hour long video. So I think it's like a third, a half, uh, half view of the video counts as a view or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, I don't think on Facebook it's a scroll, but anyway, um, there's exposure that people are getting to it. And if it's not just from my own learning, then at least there's others that have an opportunity to hear some of this stuff in a, in a medium that they may not already be going to, right? Mm -hmm. Or that they're already going to by itself, but they're not gonna go out and, you know, YouTube, uh, differences between communism and socialism, you know, it's just not their, their thing. Um, here's, here's what's my, my crossroads right now. Yeah. I have never in my probably entire life, especially adult life ever had any interest in, um, advocating for helping or in any way, shape or form being engaged with political people, figures, yeah. et cetera ever. Yep. Then I had a conversation with a judge candidate uh, at one of their fundraisers. Somebody who I met doing uh, social justice work said, hey, come to this fundraiser. I want you to meet this guy. So I met him. We talked. Um, very down to earth, fascinating conversation. Basically learned about what it even means to be a judge, not just wearing the robe, but more like uh, you can't advertise, you can't this, you can do that. You, you know, this guy. Did you know that judges don't practice generally in the area that they came from? So if you did divorce work before you were a judge, after being a judge, or when you get in the pulpit or whatever they call that thing, 
then you, you might do divorce or I'm sorry, you might do a uh, probate, you know, like it, it's not like you have an expertise. So you go in as a newbie, mm-hmm. I had no idea. So after I had that conversation, I said, you know what? I do this red phone thing. And like, I think people would like to know what you're talking about. Like this was interesting to me, like this piece. So we had a red phone. Oh, and this was fascinating. He says to me, because uh, I asked him about either a Black Lives issue or a uh, prison, uh, school to prison pipeline. And I said, you know, tell me about that. And uh, because he was currently working or had recently worked with the sheriff's department, mm-hmm. uh, he had a very close connection to it. And he goes, you know what I do think, because he's going to be a judge. He says, I do think that there's a massive discrepancy in the prosecution of these crimes. That maybe cops are or aren't arresting properly, but at the end of the day, black people are definitely um, being treated differently in the court system. And that mm-hmm. should change. I was like, well, that's interesting. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, once he becomes a judge, he can't say any of that stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. Once he becomes yeah. a judge, you're going to see that clip uh, showing up on his opponent's uh, ad campaign, you know, <laughs> the case. <said> yeah. <laughs> um, so, but what's interesting is that the day after that happened, I got another political candidate that's running for my local district state mm-hmm. rep. And they're like, hey, I saw your red phone. Would you mind if my candidate comes on? Oh, what do they do? Like, what, what is it? So it got my brain working. And I said, I don't really know exactly what the state rep exactly does. How much do they make? What, like, what's their role? I know they're supposed to make rules and laws and stuff, but what, if I don't know, maybe the public doesn't know. Would the public like to know? Could I make it entertaining enough, interesting enough that people would watch it, you know? And then I called the incumbent and I said, hey, I'm working on this other person. Do you want to do it? So they're already scheduled. Now all of a sudden I'm going, crap, I'm not a political type. I don't do any of this stuff. I don't, I'm not for advancing agendas. Like to me, there's that thing that's going on in the back here. I'm going, wait a second. Just because somebody will pick up the red phone, do you mm-hmm. really want to have them on? And so this is, this is what has been my self-discovery. It is that as long as I'm true to the purpose of education and open heart, I'm good with it. So long as it advances those two things. Now, if it's all about your, uh, the political position and my opponent sucks and they believe in abortion and I don't believe in abortion, I'm not really interested in any of that. That's not, that's not something I want to have a dialogue about. Right. I want to have a, if you've never had any experience in office, I'm okay with that. We don't have to prove that you're a schmuck, that you haven't had any experience. Let's talk about your, your current life. Let's learn about that. We can do that, right? Mm-hmm. And then if you're in office, Tell me about how is the mustard made? How do you make the sausage? Like, you know, we've heard pork spending, right? We've heard uh, gerrymandering. Like, what does that even mean, right? You might have added you some syllables to that word there. <laughs> well, and you got to, so sometimes you got to really ham up what you don't know. Yeah, gerrymandering, yeah. right? <laughs> but like part of it is the open willing to ask, because if you're sitting in a uh, HOA meeting or a, uh, a homeowner, so a home, you know, like your neighborhood association is 50 mm-hmm. other people there. They're not going to ask that question. You know what your neighbor thinking you're a schmuck, mm-hmm. you know, why is it that our district stops at this street and then goes over to this street? Let's talk about that. Like, mm-hmm. does that matter? You know, or whatever. And it's not to get that candidate to look bad, but if you have the experience and you can tell me when you go to Washington or Florida bar, where, where do you report to work? Okay, when you get there, how do you make deals? Like, tell me how that part works. Mm-hmm. And if somebody's not interested in those conversations, like the education, the learning of it, I don't know that I'm really for it. So check back with me in like six months. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, man, I know you got to go here soon. So I just want to say thanks for, first of all, doing this, but also just thanks for doing what you're doing in your own personal life. I think you are helping influencing a lot of people. You're influencing me. I know that you've got two boys you're raising as well. And I know that you're influencing them in very positive ways. And at the end of the day, I think what you're doing that I really appreciate is you're asking questions. You're, you're looking at yourself and going, I'm not what I can be. I may not have learned everything I need to know. And I, what else is there out there? And I think if we can get 90% of people uh, to do that, we'd be in a way better place. Just ask yourself, just try to find that stuff out. You know, so I really appreciate what you're doing. And like I said, thanks for inspiring me to even start doing these as well. Hopefully uh, I can be halfway as good at them, good at them as you are and maybe learn something myself. So uh, before you go, if I were to put a tagline to this episode or whatever I'm going to call it, 
what, what is your tagline? What do you think your tagline would be? Open minds and open hearts can change the world. There we go. We'll put it on a bumper sticker and make it official. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for taking this time, Jamie. Uh, I will talk to you later and I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Thanks for sticking around to the end. I really hope you enjoyed what Jamie and I had to say about a number of topics. If you didn't, let me know in the comments. If you did, let me know in the comments. And if you think you might be interested in hearing me talk or stammer rather through a lot more conversations with people, please be sure to like and subscribe to this video.